You know, when it comes to reputation, amphibians just can't seem to catch a break. They're always overshadowed by glamorous animals like lions, dolphins, birds or pandas. But, believe it or not, there once was a time where amphibians weren't overlooked, and in fact, they dominated. Some grew larger than crocodiles, others had jaws built for ambush or skulls shaped like boomerangs. They ruled ancient swamps and rivers, outcompeting everything around them. However, their reign was not to last, and their time at the top was already ticking. This is the story of how amphibians ruled the earth and how it all slipped away. Roughly 375 million years ago, during the Devonian period, a group of lobe-finned fish began the greatest jailbreak in history, the transition from aquatic life to dry land. It was from these lobe-finned fish, ancestor to modern silicants and lungfish, that the first major group of amphibians developed from. These ancient fish had joint fins with rudimentary digits, ideal for walking along the seafloor and moving across temporary land surfaces when their pools dried up. Some fish even developed primitive lungs that helped them breathe air when the stagnant pools were low in oxygen. Over millions of years, their anatomy changed, their fins would become limbs, lungs became more efficient, and a new lineage emerged, the Tetrapoda, which would eventually give rise to amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Among the earliest transitional forms was Tiktaalik, a lobe-finned fish that lived during the late Devonian period, around 375 million years ago. It was a large fish, measuring 1.25 to 2.75 meters or 4.1 to 9 feet. Tiktaalik lacked bony plates in the gill area, which meant it could move its head independently from its body, making Tiktaalik the earliest known fish to have a neck. This trait marked a significant evolutionary milestone for life on land, as this would give Tiktaalik more freedom in hunting prey in the shallows. Over time, amphibians evolved more adaptations for living on land, their lungs improved and their skeletons became stronger, better to support the weight of their body to counteract the lack of buoyancy on land. Following Tiktaalik came Istiostega. It also lived during the late Devonian and measured 1.5 meters or 4.9 feet long, making it a very large animal for its time. Interestingly, scientists think Istiostega could hear underwater, but unlike fish, which typically use a lateral line system, its ears were pockets full of air that would vibrate with sound waves. The stage was set for amphibians to rise and dominate. By the early Carboniferous period, around 360 million years ago, Earth had transformed into a vast, warm and humid greenhouse. Immense swamps and forests were filled with club mosses, tree-sized ferns, calamites and horsetails. This was a golden age for amphibians, some grew massive, reaching several meters in length. One of them was from the genus Eriops, an animal which I can best describe as what happens if a crocodile and a frog have a baby. Eriops lived in lowland habitats, around pools, streams and rivers, despite starting life from an aquatic larva. Adult Eriops could grow up to 3 meters or 9 feet and weighed between 102 to 222 kilos or 225 to 489 pounds, making them one of the largest animals of their time. As their size wasn't intimidating enough, it had many curved teeth. This suggests that they probably had a hard time brushing their teeth. This suggests that they probably swallowed slippery prey, such as large fish and aquatic tetrapods. Another unusual genus that lived during the late Carboniferous to the late Permian was Diplocalus. Diplocalus did not grow as large as Eriops, reaching up to 1 meter or 3.3 feet in length. However, it is not known for its size, but rather by its looks. They look like they ate a boomerang and quickly regretted that decision. The function of the horns at the rear of the skull is still debated. However, the most supporting hypothesis say the horns likely generated lift, just like the wings of an airplane, allowing diplocals to rise in a water column quite quickly and easily. During the Carboniferous period, there were other dominant early tetrapod predators, like Crassigirinus, which means thick tadpole. Despite not being a true amphibian, it's often grouped with amphibians of the Carboniferous period because of its aquatic lifestyle and tetrapod-like traits. It measured up to 2 meters in length, but its limbs were tiny, 
making Carnotaurus look like it was an armed wrestler champion. Krasin Girinius could open its jaws widely at a 60 degree angle, allowing it to grasp and consume relatively large prey items, most likely fish. Everything was going great for the amphibians. The world was theirs, occupying top predator niches in rivers, lakes and swamps. But their dominance was not built to last. Despite being the top predators, it was one of their characteristics that ended up being their doom and changed the course of evolution forever. As the Carboniferous rolled on, Earth's climates shifted drastically. The abundant plants that made up the rainforests sucked massive amounts of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and buried it in the soil. This led to the formation of coal deposits that put the word carbon into Carboniferous. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere reduced and the climate became cooler and drier. Rainforests began to fragment into isolated patches. Just like modern habitat fragmentation, this cut off population and resources, reducing biodiversity. This was the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. The sudden collapse also affected several groups of vertebrate animals. One of them were amphibians. Despite having developed adaptations for living in dry land, this climate shift exposed the fundamental limitation of amphibians. They were still dependent on water for reproduction. Amphibian eggs don't have a hard shell, like reptiles, birds and monotremes do. Take a look at the eggs of a golden striped salamander, for example. You can clearly see the embryo developing inside. Pretty cool, right? This means that their eggs need to be constantly wet, otherwise they dry out. This is where amniotes fared better. Amniotes at the time resembled small lizards, with fossil evidence suggesting that they appeared no later than the earliest Carboniferous or late Devonian period. Amniotes are also tetrapod vertebrate animals, like amphibians, but they differ in some key respects. One of them is how their eggs are structured. Amniote eggs have three extra embryonic membranes, amnion for the protection of the embryo, chorion for gas exchange, and the lentuas for disposing of metabolic waste, because the amnion and the fluid it secretes shield the embryo from environmental fluctuations, amniotes can reproduce on dry land. Amphibians had a harder time adapting to the drier conditions that dominated the late Carboniferous and the Permian, and species that required constant humidity and lush vegetation went extinct. Amniotes, on the other hand, with shelled eggs and scales covering their body, fared much better in this new drier world. This led them to acquire new habits and resources faster than amphibians, becoming the dominant land vertebrates and ultimately began the era of synapsids. However, those amphibians that were semi or fully aquatic or could handle seasonal dryness by burrowing survived and continued to diversify. By the way, this is a rain frog from the genus Breviceps. These are really cool and interesting frogs and definitely deserve their own video. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like that. Anyways, back to the story. One of these groups that diversified throughout the Permian were Archegosauroids. These amphibians were highly specialized for living in fresh water most of their lives. We know this because fossil evidence suggests they retain internal gills much like fish throughout adulthood and their body structure and limb size also indicate poor locomotion on land. And surprisingly, or perhaps not, archegosauroids regulated body temperature, exchanged gases and managed osmotic pressure in ways that resembled fish more than modern aquatic amphibians. Despite this, they belong to the clade Temnosponili, an extreme diverse group of early tetrapods that are often considered ancient amphibians. Some of their representatives resembled crocodiles in build, despite sharing no close evolutionary relationship with them, a case of convergent evolution. Some of these crocodile-looking amphibians include Archegosaurus, Platyoposaurus, Melosaurus, Construcovia, Colidosuchs, and the largest amphibian ever discovered, the Prionosuchs plumeri. It's been estimated to grow over 5.5 meters or 18 feet long and look very similar to a modern gharial. It had a long, slender snout, many sharp teeth and a tail adapted for swimming. Probably it was an ambush predator, feeding on fish and other aquatic animals. But within the earth, something was stirring, something even these giants couldn't survive. 
Approximately 252 million years ago, at the end of the Permian period, Earth experienced the most severe extinction event in history. Massive volcanic eruptions in Siberia triggered climate change, water acidification and widespread system collapse. This was the Permian-Triassic extinction. Roughly 95% of species vanished and amphibians were hit hard. Archegosauroids were extinct and the niche was filled by reptiles such as phytosaurs in the Triassic period. Amphibians were no longer rulers, others took over, like Synognathus, a mammal-like reptile synapsid. However, not all was lost, as some temnospondyls continued to flourish and diversified in the late Permian and Triassic. Some, like Stereospondyli, became more dependent on life in the water. One example is Paracyclotosaurus davidi. It lived during the Middle Triassic period and measured up to 2.45 meters or 8 feet long and weighed between 159 and 365 kilograms or 351 and 805 pounds. Others, like the Trematosaurids, even adapted to a life in the sea, making them the first and only marine amphibians, with the exception of the modern crab-eating frog Fejervaria cancrivora. During the early Triassic, these aquatic temnospondyls dominated ecosystems. However, as the Triassic went on, they progressively declined and only a few got to see the Jurassic and Cretaceous period. Once dominant predators, the rulers of ancient swamps and rivers were gone. However, some slipped through the cracks of extinction and are alive today. Modern amphibians are no longer the giants of the Permian. Many species came and gone since then, but a single lineage of resilient amphibians survived. These are the Lysamphibia, which means smooth amphibian. The origin of Lysamphibians is still argued by scientists. Some say Gerobatrach Shotoni from the early Permian is a Lysamphibian. It measured 11 centimeters or 4.3 inches and possessed characteristics from both frogs, like the head, and the salamander, like a tail, leading some to call it frogmander. However, others argue that the earliest Lysamphibians are from the early Triassic, namely Triadobatrachus massinoti. It lived during the early Triassic, around 250 million years ago, in what is now Madagascar. It measured 10 cm or 4 inches and still retained some primitive characteristics, like a short tail, which it may have retained as an adult. Whether the first Lysamphibian were from the early Permian or early Triassic, this group of amphibians was resilient to say the least and made it through to modern day. These amphibians include three groups of modern living amphibians, Anura, frogs and toads, Urudella, salamanders and newts, and Apuda, the limbless Sicilians. Currently, approximately 8,000 species are known. Of them, nearly 90% are frogs and toads, including the smallest vertebrate in the world. The New Guinea Amal frog, Pedofrin amauensis, it measures 7.7 mm or 0.3 inches and belongs to the family Microilidae, commonly known as narrow-mouthed frogs. Others, like the South China giant salamander, Andrea sligoi, can reach 1.8 meters or 5 feet 9 in length and weigh more than 50 kilograms or 140 pounds, making it the largest living amphibian, a great deal smaller than Prionosuchs, but still impressive. Yet, despite their resilience, two in five amphibians are threatened with extinction, making them the most threatened vertebrates on the planet. Sadly, 41% of all species face extinction due to habitat loss, climate change, disease, fire, invasive species, and overexploitation. Salamanders are particularly at risk, with three out of every five species threatened with extinction. Not exactly what you would expect from a once ruler group. But here's the thing. Survival isn't about dominance, it's about adaptation, endurance and resilience. Amphibians may no longer be kings, but, in a sense, they became legends instead. Their lineage was the first to crawl out of the water, the first to hear sound on land, and the first to leave footprints on dry earth. And if all you remember is this, for a moment in time, they ruled it all.